And that was great. Synergy Project Performance Audit. We still need to take attendance. Uh, Mr. Hall, why don't you start? Uh, Ernie Hall, thank you for the assembly. Jennifer Johnston. Bill Evans. Tim Steele, so. Pete Peterson, assembly. Bill Starr. Nobody's out there talking to 1011. Uh, Dick Trainee, anchor assembly. Peter Rusty, the controller. Mike Chadwick, internal audit. Zig Rosen, Zico Consulting. And you have support team in the audience, or is it uh, just I'm here? I'm here. Managing there. principal. Great. And the game, same thing here as audit chair. Um, I, I tend to have a little looser format, but you have a prescribed program um, for that. And so the idea that it's sort of open mic, that's the way I like to run my meetings, but I think out of the fact <coughs> that it's a little hard to manage. We're going to cut you short by a, a few minutes. We've run a little bit long, only by 10 minutes. So at 3.30, uh, you need to be done, and I'll. Uh, uh, no matter where we're at at 3.30, I'm going to know this. So, okay, you're good with that? Sure. Great. Ready to go? Yeah, reintroduce yourself and what you do. Okay. Uh, and by the way, I've been told to speak up because out in the back there, they, they like to hear something. So. Yeah. You're doing fine. Okay. Uh, I'm Zig Bersons. I'm the managing principal of Zico Consulting. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chairman of the Audit Committee, Mr. Chairman of the Assembly, Audit Committee members, and Assembly members, thank you very much for being here and for giving me the opportunity to chat with you today about the performance audit of the Synergy Project. So today I'm going to talk about what we did. I'm going to talk about what we observed, our conclusions, and our recommendations. We are going to focus on very specific recommendations, and those will be actionable recommendations. Okay? So, Peter, go ahead. Dave is the assembly contractor. I understand. The independent assessment of this project. Yes. The distinguished step from the SAP. And you had the RFP oversight uh, on that. Mr. Chadwick did. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. So, so basically, what was what was the assignment? Examine the project management. Examine the project resources. Examine the scheduling. Examine the budget. Develop an assessment and give you recommendations. <coughs> okay? So uh, basically what we did is we uh, interviewed a lot of people. I think many of you have been interviewed. Would that be a fair statement? Okay. Um, it included all the members of the Functional Steering Committee, all the members of the Executive Steering Committee, it included the Program Manager, and included 13 Project Managers. They also interviewed the functional teams. So every one of those functional teams, we sat in a room and chatted, okay? Uh, we also uh, interviewed the systems integrator. We had conversations with SAP. Uh, we had uh, a review of about 50 documents that we looked at, all right? And then we actually conducted a survey of the staff. I think most of you responded to that s survey. Would that be a fair statement? Okay, a lot of head nods. <laughs> So some of the key documents that we looked at. We looked at the, uh, the draft uh, design document from SAP. We looked at the draft of uh, MOA's response to that document. We looked at 50 other documents, which were, which were samples of reporting, milestone reporting, plans, schedules, a lot of detailed data. I think we need to let you know that there's an awful lot of documents that were appropriate and proper, and that's the kind of things that should have been there, okay? So it's not everything is taking a shot at you. In terms of some of the uh, documentation we had, just a few highlights of things that we did notice. Okay, the assembly status reports, we thought that uh, they didn't include a project outlook, and they didn't give you any rec recommended actions. We thought maybe that would be appropriate for something coming to the assembly. The change order log was, was inconsistent with regard to its assignments uh, and, and the fact that it, the change orders were mainly for the systems integrator. There weren't, I couldn't find any change orders for the individual contractors. We we'll to track them all, right? I would point a question on that. How far back did you go then? And did you look at the breakdown into the Black and Beach history and no. some of that? Okay. No, so I did you're not. you're talking about very current point in time? Okay, very Thank current. You. Uh, the project cost, couldn't find any tracking in the, in the project costing of, of the actual change order. By change order, what was the impact of that project cost? We did see changes to purchase orders, okay? 
the, the uh, organization and change management and training group in the organization chart did not, currently does not report to the project or the program manager. Okay? And as you saw in the SAP document, that's a fairly important component as we go forward. You'll hear more about that. The issues log was inconsistent. We, we didn't have target dates on every line item. We didn't have closure dates. We didn't, it wasn't clear who was assigned. The blueprint, the, the version that we saw, and that was our understanding is the final version, said draft on the front page. When we started looking through that document, it was fairly clear that there were blank pages. There were sections that were blank, and there were also sections that said TBD, to be determined. Ergo, the blueprint wasn't finished. Uh, the process flow diagrams, there's 138 process flow diagrams. There are still about 14 or 15 that need to be done. So the process flow diagrams are also incomplete. Uh, the master pro, uh, pro project plan, there is a master project plan. It just didn't go down very low level. It didn't go down to the team level, team leader level. And then when we looked at the master uh, uh, project plan, there were a lot of assignments to groups of people as opposed to individuals. And if you're worried about accountability, you need to have individuals responsible for tasks, not groups. Um, the, uh, the SAP uh, design QA document, the, the report that you, you, you uh, did not have yet is, is the one that talks about what, what the es estimated hours are for low, risk, low, medium, and high risk hours. And so that's, that's a, a base point to use for estimating <coughs> purposes. The concern we had is that the high risk items said 500 hours plus. That's not very precise. I mean, so definitely more work needs to be done there. Make sense? Yeah, let the record show Ms. Dombowski is here, and as uh, I informed, meaning this one will be over at 3.30. Okay, so we're now we'd like to just give you some commentary about the project organization. How are my pictures, by the way? Beautiful. Local pictures, thank you. <laughs> um, that picture was not taken from any place around here. It was, you know, anywhere from the web. Okay, so what, what is the position as we view it in terms of your project governance. And when we talk about project governance, we are referring to the committee, okay? So recent shifts in the synergy project structure, we suggest to you are in the right direction. So the formation of the functional student committee is good. Absolutely. Um, and the addition of skilled project managers is good. So we, we agree with those steps. But we also say to you that the execution could be improved. Um, so the project scheduling and planning was not really effectively delegated between the various levels. And this goes down to the fact that the team leaders, when we asked some of the team leaders, do you, do you have a copy of the project plan? No. Have you seen the project plan? No. Do you know where the project plan is? Maybe. Okay, so needless to say, that was an indication of the fact that this information was not getting down to the people who do the work. And on that page seven of your slide, Ms. Johnston? The, the project plan, now was this a project plan that had been around for six months? A project plan that's been around for, I mean, do you know? The one, the one that we looked at, the one that we looked at was fairly current. It was updated um, in November, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the last item is the fact that you know, again, we're talking about governance, multiple committees, a lot of overlap in <coughs> responsibilities, a lot of confusion with regard to accountabilities because even even those committees need to have some accountability. So, so there's a, there's the there's the executive team, the, the executive steering committee, the technology steering committee, and the and what we are calling the synergy functional steering committee, overlapping. A point of clarity: it, that sounds like an opinionated statement based on your interviews. Could you give me something a little bit more specific in how you find that finding itself? Well, in terms of the fact that I interviewed every one of the people that were there yes. and, and asking them, what is it you do and what is your understanding? Okay. So I've got interview notes that basically said, what is your understanding of what your responsibilities are? What are you supposed to do? 
So when, when, we see an org, when we see an org chart that talks about that project team and assigned duties and responsibilities, you're saying that the, the people inside of that group didn't understand that or Correct. had no relevance to it? Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, there, there's definitely confusion as to responsibilities and accountabilities okay. in those committees. The, to the point where I, I know, for instance, the Functional Steering Committee is still struggling with trying to finalize its charter. Okay, I mean, it's been operating for two months. And the, the charter's not done yet. Thanks. Mr. Chair, yes. to that question. Did you see, you say there's overlapping um, oversight, but was there any communication or were there any members that were part of all those teams so you had the communication flow between different teams? Yes, yes and no. And, uh, you know, and we've got actually recommendations about that because there is a, situ you know, there is a situation with the Functional Steering Committee and the executive steering committee, which could be solved with just a, a slight restructure on the functional steering committee, which we, we will address. And, and let the record show the mayor's been here. I just forgot to recognize it for a moment, so thank you. Okay, so, so now in terms of the actual project organization, uh, you've heard this before, it's consistent. There's no question that you've got a difficulty in getting your MOA staff committed full-time to the project. Backfill has been promised. In some cases, it's taken place, but it's been very slow to actually happen. Now, there also, with regard to the project, you know, when we started talking to the various functional team leaders and team members, many of them were frustrated by the fact that they weren't getting access to the experts. Okay, they were not getting ex access to the experts. So, so there was a lot of frustration about that because they wanted, they wanted it. They knew, they knew that they had to have that knowledge transfer, but the, the, uh, the experts were time sliced. They were splitting their time between various different groups. And as always, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Uh, the utilities participation, I would suggest to you, was, at least came across to us as being defensive rather than participative. Uh, they were protecting their needs. They were very concerned about their needs and making sure that their needs were, were taken care of. That can be and should be solved just simply by organizationally restructuring. And we talk about that, how to do that. The other thing that con was concerning to us is because the utility folks were following a parallel organization. They were reporting up outside their own organization, outside the project, and then bringing all that information back in around. So it was one of those circles. Uh, the the uh, project has experienced turnover in critical areas. I think uh, if payroll, you just recently lost somebody in payroll. So those, kind, those are examples. But the longer a project goes, the more you're going to have turnover. So you've got to plan for that. And apparently that really hasn't been happening. Um, you've got a lot of advisors and experts and so forth, but the project organization chart didn't even include all of them. Should. Should know where they all are. And I think I mentioned to you that even though the, even though the uh, organizational change management group was not reporting to the program manager, they weren't even on the organization chart. So you didn't even know they were there. Okay. Uh, with regard to some, comp some observations about project governance, the functional steering committee came across to us as having a very granular controlling approach. So if they're not really being a steering committee if they're granular. They don't need to do the program manager's job for the program manager. The executive steering committee has experienced turnover the last four years. No surprise there. It's the folks that are in the executive steering committee are, in many cases, folks that are at will, right? So you are going to experience turnover, potentially. And potentially, you're going to experience turnover soon, right? And if that's the case, you ought to be planning for that. Um, and the same with the executive sponsor. I mean, you, you're, with the executive sponsor now, you've actually had two executive sponsors within a year. Hopefully, you won't have to go to a third executive sponsor in just a few months. And you're talking to CFO then, or who are you talking to? I am to? talking to CFO, yes, sir. Okay, we, we said that we ran a survey. 
The whole idea was to get information from everybody that worked on the project, okay? Uh, and the, the results were excellent, all right? Uh, we ran a survey from 122 to 24. Uh, we had uh, 248 surveys went out, but that's, the reason it's so high is we wanted to find out how many people used to work on the project. So we wanted to see what that was going to tell us, as well as the current project folks, and that included contractors. So we ended up with 146 responses, 128 were municipal, municipality, and 18 were contractors, okay? And remember, whenever we say contractors, it's the systems integrator staff plus all the individual contractors that you have there on the project. So, not, not important to read this, when you have, you can see it in the handout, but I think it's important to recognize we did also include the super users, and the super users are where the rubber meets the road. When you roll out this system, that's where it's all going to happen. And if they're not on board, we're going to have issues. So we wanted to know what the super users had to say. All right? And so we did include them in the survey, and you'll notice that 56 super users responded to the survey. Okay. I'm going to ask a question. Your definition of training, then, are you actually talking about, you're mixing a couple of vernaculars here for me. Is okay. that first, they didn't understand the scope and the training and, or the, uh, the whole program oversight itself because they didn't know where it was headed. And now you seem to be specific to illustrated finding on this one slide that says 53% of them uh, said that training was limited. What training are you talking about? When, when you start a, a major implementation, such as an SAP, yes. typically you're going to want to train the people that are working on the project team. That's one training. Okay? Specific to the program specific or specific to the, the product? The project implementation. Specific to the product so they know how to configure it. So that typically happens early. Then when you get at the back end and you're ready to roll it out, you have another set of training. That's the training for the, the users, the everyday folks out there who have to know how to use the system. And now you have to worry about how you could train those folks. Okay? Yes. So in this case, we were talking about different people in different roles, and these are the people who were supposedly in the training role who are going to provide training. Okay. The okay? trainers the trainers of the, of the yes, training. Yes, sir. All right. So a couple of highlights. Uh, here we go with training. <coughs> Uh, so we asked the question, so what is the adequacy of training among the people who are on the staff? This is that early training. How well did you learn SAP when you started out in this thing, and how well are you prepared to, in essence, contribute and be a member of the, of the implementation team? 75% said their training was limited to none. We think that's an issue. Okay. We think that's an issue. Then we ask the super users the same question. Now, how well are you as a super user prepared to do your job when it's time? 53% said limited or not. Okay? I have a question about where in your summary of training does it fit you know in, in my experience in business your implementation phase comes later on after you've designed developed put the hardware in place and all this stuff so implementation ultimately has training modules in it as well sort of the, the worker groups learn how to run it once it's ready to run so your observation here is a little bit hard for me to challenge is that you could analyze that training didn't occur but we, we already know we weren't there yet because we haven't started implementing it. Except, except, that, except that you have an organization change management group, and their job is to focus on how do we affect change, and the best way of affecting change is to preview it. Begin early. Mm -hmm. So should you do some cursory, higher level, uh, conceptual training? Absolutely, you should, and not, not wait until the very end. Because, you know, a lot of folks will say, oh, <coughs> wait until the very end because people will forget and you've got to do it, make it current training and just in time training. I understand that. Okay? But you've got to get them ready. 
and especially in your case, you're faced with, I think, some fairly significant uh, changes like centralization of payroll. That's well, I don't think 53% of the super users that I would expect to have exposure to it, it seems low. The other one where you said that the average person inside the system at 75, oh. that doesn't... No, what I was talking about was the members of the team. 70% okay. was members of the team not having the training. That means you've got people that are currently trying to configure this product, and they're saying they don't have enough training to understand and know what the, know what the product is. Good enough. Thank you. Okay. Um, we also wanted to find out, what, did, did you have enough SAP knowledge on the team to try to offset this fact that you didn't have training? And the answer is a good answer. You know, the, of the contractors, the average number of years of experience, and I think we saw that on, on your slide, right? 11 years. Okay, that's good. We looked at communications. We asked the question, right? Rate the effectiveness of communication between the project team and the rest of the organization, the future users. How well is the project team talking to everybody else? Are they keeping them informed? Over 70% of, of the active team members basically said it's ineffective or only somewhat effective. Communication is a concern. Folks out there are, are saying, I don't know what's going on. Okay? Then you have a corollary to that question about communication, which is how well is the team communicating among themselves? Am I still loud enough back there? Okay. So, so how well are they communicating among themselves? 70%, pretty similar number, basically said either it's ineffective communication or somewhat effective communication. Now, Folks can say, we're putting emails out, we're putting messages out, you can say that you're doing that, but the perception is, if that's what the people are saying, they're, I don't know what's happening, people are not telling me what's going on, then that's what you have to react to. Okay? It's the famous, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make them drink. This one, this one I found shocking. I have an exclamation point there because I find it shocking. Do you have specific deliverables clearly identified for your delivery each week? Nearly 70% of the MOA staff said no. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing or while they're working on the project. Huh. How do you get any work done? And the average overall was 50% for everybody. That, in, that includes some contractors. Shocking. Mr. Evans? Yeah, I was, in light of the, the comments we had last time about, uh, Ms. Gard was, was talking about how the project, the implementation has kind of, as I understood it, stopped since end of November, beginning of December. And this survey, has been conducted entirely during that time period. Um, it, was that? I mean, it seems like people would be just. I would expect being a bit of a uh, confusion or a quandary because the project has essentially stopped during this period. Would, does, is that accounted for? And, and yeah, I mean, we, uh, we we basically talked about over the history of the project, how long you've been there, and all that kind of thing. Absolutely, absolutely. So this is a <coughs> talked back to the project. You bet. Plus. I think I told you I met with virtually every functional group of almost every person who's supposed to be full time on, on the project. And you know, anecdotal information supports all this. Every, the interviews said the same thing. Said the same thing. When I sat in one group, I, I sat there and I asked the team leader, I said, so do you have a project plan? They said, no. I said, do um, you know where it is? Well, maybe. You know, they don't know. Okay. So the other thing we did in the survey, we said, well, oh, I'm what? Sorry, Ms. Gray Jackson sure. uh, had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, on page 18, when you said that um, 
that folks didn't know what they're supposed to be doing. And I think you also said that even the contractors didn't know what they were supposed to be doing. There are some contractors that answered that they did not know what they had to get done by the end of the week. Really, that's um, puzzling to me because they're getting paid to know what they're some supposed of, to no, some do. Of those, I'm not asking you. Yeah, but but some, of, some of those well, contractors are, they're, 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 they're staff people too. I mean, they're not just managers. I mean, some of the contractors have, you know, somebody is giving them assignments. And if it's somebody that didn't do it well enough or in detail enough, then they would have to answer the question right. that way. Thank you. Thank you okay. No, I'm not taking a shot at contractors. No, I didn't say you were. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we also asked them about additional tools that would make you more successful. So there's the list of additional tools. Notice the number one was training. Okay. Clearer specifications. Yes, they wanted to get paid overtime. Um, improved communications. So these things are consistent. Clarification of expectations. This gets down to nobody. If you can't, if you don't know what you're supposed to be done by the end of the week, then you, apparently you don't know what the expectation is. Okay, a dedicated, knowledgeable consultant. They they really wanted to have somebody paying attention to their area, and they were finding that wasn't happening. Okay, and the last one, um, sidebar on this last one. As, as you probably all know, the uh, you started out in the, the fire training room, right? Fire department training room? No. Don't know all the reasons. But ultimately, you ended up on the seventh floor here. And my understanding is that at one point in time, some very nice ergonomic chairs were purchased and provided to the team. I went down to the seventh floor room not more than two weeks ago, and that place is horrible. And there isn't one good chair in there. So take that with a grain of salt. Okay, it's not it's not a nice place to work. I, I wouldn't like it. I don't know how some of the rest of you feel, but I wouldn't like it down there. Uh, okay, so some common threads uh, from the survey. Very consistent. This is a common thread now. The other one, so this is happening. Multiple people were saying this: poor communication, clarity of plan, clarity of responsibility, no confidence in finishing since it's gone on so long. Worried about having on ongoing internal support, comparison to people saw failures, lack of confidence, existing ERP is not sustainable. So the team members understand sticking around with people soft is not a good idea. Okay? Walls between MOA and the systems integrator, teaming is not very good. So some of the folks were saying, hey, we really would, they're back to this, we, they, they want their dedicated consultant working with them. Here are some selected comments from the survey. No one has come to look at what we're doing. Okay, and it's, they, want, they want somebody to show that they care. Right? I'm encouraged by the new CFO's involvement with the project now. That's a, that's a good thing. because uh, <laughs> From a super user, I don't know what the status is or when I would be expected to train. Not much information given from the top. <coughs> Fair, it, it just continues to say the same message. Okay? So, I want you to know I, I really looked hard for this picture. So what happened? What happened? I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we'll spend a little bit of time on what happened. There are three components or three attributes to a successful project. All right? Scope and quality, resources and cost, and staff, and then the time and the schedule. Those three components need to be in balance. The project management, program management, and project governance, that's what keeps it in balance. Okay? So what happened? If you look question, then you, you're sure. assuming throughout this that the SAP is actually the right product for the job. Did you have any discussion about that? Oh yeah, no, it was, it was we're assuming that's where you are, that's where you're going. I, I didn't look at <laughs> going back there. No. Uh, I mean, it's, yeah. It doesn't make any it's sense. It's a perfectly fine. It's a perfectly fine software product. Yeah. It's so hard to implement because it's complex. Mr. Cheney, go ahead. Well, Mike, had we uh, kept with PeopleSoft, wouldn't we have to go back and do every other update 
and every modification. Absolutely, that we dealt with every update to that. Absolutely, you, you, you. That's one of the reasons why I think folks recognize that it's an unsustainable solution for you right now. I mean, you are so far behind in updates that you're going to have to go through a series of you know update exercises, which all could take as much as six months. And every modification. That we've every modification that. you've made has to be replicated in each one of those cycles and tested. I mean, it's not easy. And you've modified the product a lot. Thank you, sir. Okay? Well, I don't want to diverge, Lance. It's just, it's an unsupported product. Is that what you're going to say? Or where do you want to go with that? I was just going to add, Lance Ahern through the chair, that the previous finding was that we could not update the existing yeah. product. We would have to re-implement it. I understand. Okay. It's even worse. Okay, so what happens? So if you look on page uh, 24, the reason why there are three arrows on the scope quality thing is because scope and quality is all about depth and breadth. Depth and breadth. So when we start thinking about depth, we're talking about how deep do you go in terms of doing the work that you're supposed to do. Ergo, you've already heard Blueprint didn't get finished. That's a depth issue. That got squeezed down. Didn't finish all the, uh, the, the uh, process flow diagrams. That got squeezed out. Now you got a width thing because we saw we heard that earlier. We said, oh, we're not going to do cash management. Now that's a, that's a module. So in essence, that box got <laughs> smaller, all right, because of those squeezes, both for depth and breadth. And the other thing that's happened, of course, we've already heard, didn't get the dedicated resources, didn't get the staff. Right? So what happens? The time schedule starts climbing, and so you end up with revised go lives multiple times. Okay? Cutting corners on design leading to design issues late in the project completion cycle. Your team is making design assessments and decisions now on something that in theory you should have finished when you finished the blueprint and it's causing you to spin. It's causing you to spin, okay? And the other thing I think is important to recognize is if you've got, you know, we, we, we talked about these overlapping committees, your decision cycle starts spreading out. And it starts taking longer and longer, okay? I've seen the email trail. When you first started talking about inception to date conversion, we talked about that in the last session. Okay, inception today. There are dates, email dates that are a year old, a year old, trying to make that decision. Okay. We looked at the budget. Just a few highlights. This is this is the you know unaudited uh, you know I got got this from the controller. Just un unaudited numbers that are give you orders of magnitude of where you're at. I just wanted to highlight some things for you. You are tracking MOA labor. Good for you. Good for you. You know what the whole, pro the whole project is going to cost. A lot of public sector organizations do not do this. They just go, out, they just focus on out of pockets. So this is good for you, all right? But I want to remind you that there are some other items floating around there that you're going to have to pay attention to as you go forward. Will you or will you not need more hardware? So that's going to be an out-of-pocket cost. Training, it's not a big number, but you've got to recognize that, hey, we may have to do more training. And that's going to probably cost us those kind of dollars because that's basically SAP courses, okay? Um, and same with um, other maintenance. Yeah, you pay maintenance every year. You don't need to continue doing it. It's a good thing, but understand that every year you're going to get a number. All right? As you as you look forward on this project, if it takes one year or two years, you still get that maintenance hanging out there too. Then uh, down at the bottom, I just wanted to show you that that's the unaudited totals of what's on the purchase orders, and what's been and what's been spent and what's remaining. I just want to tell you that. That's, there's no way that that's going to cover finishing. Just no, it's not going to cover. It's not going to cover you finishing this thing. Okay. What we want to look at you, 
no names up here, no names of organizations, but at least this is where the money is going for your contractors. And we did find one PO for one contractor that was a little odd. It, you know, it, I think there's some confusion as to, because it's a, it's a municipal-wide contract, how much of it is going to this project, I don't know. But that's, that's a significant amount of money. Can you name the two of the original integrators? Oh, sure, Black and Beach and, and uh, Peloton. So the second systems integrator is now Peloton. Yeah, yep. Okay. I just didn't know if we wanted to get into those names. Okay. So some conclusions about the budget. The expenditures are not completely surprising. This is SAP. It's big, it's complex, it's not surprising that you're going to get those kind of numbers, okay? You, and, and so, it, but you know, and the other, the other troubled implementations, which this sounds like it is a troubled implementation, are San Diego and, and Portland, you know, so their numbers are not too different from what you're experiencing. Uh, the balance of the budget will not come close to addressing the implementation completion. I told you about the confusion on the uh, tracking of the contractor charges. And then I think we need to recognize that all these delays, your perception, you know, now you need to be looking at this project going forward, and you're going to have additional costs coming at you. And you've already heard about some of those that, you, that weren't there three years ago. And that's this whole business of, well, do we want to upgrade the enterprise technology in the enterprise environment? Uh, we got to do some upgrades, I mean, so these, these are all additional things that are happening to you because you're three years in. 45 minutes, sir. To go? To go. I, I'm, 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 I'm almost halfway through. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, so, so some of the conclusions then. You know, I've got four pages here, I think I numbered them one, two, three, and four. That's good. Um, I, the first conclusion is we definitely believe the project is salvageable, okay? But you must assure that you have as-built documentation. You do not want to fall into the same trap you fell into with PeopleSoft. You do not want to make modifications and changes or configurations to this product and not document them so that three years from now when you come up with an upgrade or a change, you won't be able to do it without spending a fortune. Okay? You need to have a solid platform for the continuing use of the project and future upgrades. You do need to realize that all those future upgrades become small projects. They all become small projects. Okay? Now, given the fact that you've got a pause going on, we're trying to, we want to warn you that there is a risk, now that you've got a pause going on, that you can open Pandora's box. And we urge you, we urge you, please do not open Pandora's box. Do not go back and say, oh, we're going to take a look at our business requirements again, and we're going to go and open, open that blueprint, and we're going to rewrite the blueprint. Probably take you years. I wouldn't do it. Focus on as built. Focus on as built. So as you, you already have a configured product, in some form or fashion, almost done. Document what you've built. Document the configuration. That you should do. <clears throat> Make sense? I used the decreasing word on the scope earlier in the conversation in the work session you attended. I, I saw you here. The, the observation that you say we shouldn't expand uh, that scope or revisit the original modeling, what about a question that, that you perhaps could simplify the scope of work by decreasing, say, the utilities or the enterprises as well. You're not supposed to take my thunder. I didn't. I hope I didn't. I'm no, I'm we, we do talk about, we do talk about going forward and how you need to uh, subdivide the project into what I'm referring to as chunks. Okay. I didn't Identify that, so. chunks, and yeah. that's coming. Definitely, that's in, in our opinion, that's the only way you're going to get forward with this thing and get to something that. Yeah. All right. Well, deliver your message. I, I didn't mean okay. to interrupt it. I didn't uh, understand. So if it's in here, you'll get to it. Uh, so, the, uh, so I'm, I'm on page 31. The project team must establish <laughs> accountability at the team leader level. 
got to get all that down to, in effect, your sergeants. <coughs> okay? Project team must establish consistency and diligence at the manager level. You have multiple contractors who are now project managers, multiple projects. You got to make sure they do it the same way. Okay? That's up to the program manager. Program manager's got to lay that out and say, this is the way we're going to do it. Because as soon as you have a contractor A from contractor company A and contractor B from contractor company B and they can do it their way, you're done. You're done. Okay? Project plan must subdivide the implementation into achievable chunks for each project manager. We suggest three to four month chunks. It's got to be something you can see. You got to see the end. Got to see the end. And if you can, everybody will go. It'll, it'll be easy. Truly easy. Oh, we'll get that done by May. Yeah, okay. You can figure it out. Um, project plan must identify tasks for team members that have a horizon short enough to see their completion. So you want the project managers and the leaders to look at these chunks that are three to four months. The team needs to look at things that are next Friday. Next Friday. <coughs> Everything is next Friday. The team leaders need to make it. The, the assignments, the folks working on it, need to understand and agree. And then you say, can you get it done by next Friday? 8 o'clock in the morning next Friday, because I need time to look at it. OK? Make sense? It works. I'm telling you, it works. Here's the, here's the next one that works, right? Project results tracking must be based on completions and only completions. So think about this. If you're saying, can you get it done next Friday? That's what you're talking about. You don't want to know it's 50% complete. You don't want to know that they just started. You just simply want to know you were supposed to write that procedure, and it's going to take you, we agreed, it's going to take you eight hours, and you can get it done by next Friday. <coughs> Great. What are you looking for? You're looking for the procedure. And guess what? When, you're, when you've got the procedure and you've got a list of 50 procedures, you take off the procedure, it's done, and what do you do? You tell the program manager, I have 10 procedures, I'm 10% done. Because I have a finished procedure. And you can make every activity that way, within reason. Now, there's, there's, there's exceptions to the story. Bottom line, MOA must provide the necessary subject matter expertise as required in the staffing plan. So, so I, I know that somebody's not going to be happy when I say this. Two weeks from now, when you get your plan, you need to see a staffing plan. A staffing plan. Not only a schedule, but a staffing plan. It says, when am I using these people? <laughs> okay? You need to do that. Okay, I don't see any other way. How can anybody sit there and say, yeah, you can have my folks? And you say, oh, week three, month two, you need my person for two days. Okay. MOA must forward schedule the project. I think that there's the history here of backward scheduling has gotten this, this municipality in trouble. Put the stake in the ground and start backward scheduling and squeeze. And when you start squeezing, what happens? <coughs> Scope and quality and all those things go, go. Um, now, MOA should apply the SFP recommendations regarding configuration and documentation. Absolutely you should. I mean, they've gone through a tremendous amount of effort to give you detail by line item. Do it. I have a question, and it's not intentional um, <coughs> to poke here, but the SAP findings per se were, were supplied to us today. How much integration did you have with the SAP research team on their audit, if you're able to suggest an audit in yours? Actually, actually I've, I've actually met with them several times, and I have seen their draft of that huge document uh, 10 days ago. Mm -hmm. I've, gone, I've gone through it, every line item. <laughs> okay? Yeah, and I guess the the other conversation I have in here is that you're you're coming to your end here, but it doesn't talk to us specific about contractor integration. That's coming, sir. 
Okay. So go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, MOA should use the SAP low risk items to define an achievable project chunk so it can create an early victory. And I know that activity is going on right now. And that's exactly what should be happening. And I am sure that's what you're going to see on the 27th. You know, it's going to be here's the first piece that we can get done. Here's when we can get it done. And Katie, bar the door, let's go. And I think that's going to happen. Uh, the MOA's project plan needs to include external dependencies. For those of you who give up resources, I know there's a concern, right? But the way you address that is you plan it. You plan it. So if you're an accounting person and you need to be gone for the next two months working on the CAFR, that should be in the plan. Simple. If, you, if you're a payroll person and every two weeks you need a week or every three weeks you need a week to process the payroll, it should be in the plan. Then you don't have these issues. And that just doesn't change the fact that I still think that all of your team leaders need to be full time. Absolutely, your team leaders need to be full time. And, uh, okay, MOA should manage all of its contractors with deliverables. Okay, I, it's important that every one of your contractors have deliverables, and that's the way you manage it. Okay, so it doesn't matter if it's a systems integrator, it doesn't matter, matter if it's a project manager. If it's a project manager, you ought to be able to say, I expect a status report from you every Friday, 8 o'clock in the morning. Meet with your team, give me a status report. Whatever the case may be. It has to happen. You can't just let them clock hours. And lastly, MOA must revitalize the project. Your project is stagnant. Stagnant. Morale's down, okay? The momentum is not going anywhere. Gotta revitalize. Gotta revitalize. So, so what kinds of things can you do? Quick success, right? Focus on that first quick success. Get that going and move on. Celebrate those successes. I know it's been done before, but I'm saying fine, go ahead and do it again. Celebrate the success. <coughs> but this time, we're going to have a success. If you do a three to four month deal, at the end of the three to four months, you got something. Celebrate it. Build team spirit again. I think you got to get your team back into this, you know, together as much as you possibly can. Having, especially your leadership, you don't want to have your team leaders working in their cubicle. All right? They've got to be with the people. Project managers need to be with the people, not in a cubicle somewhere else. All right? I even think you might consider tearing out the walls on the seventh floor room. Make it a bigger room. Okay? Um, page uh, 35. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> um, get the project managers with the team. We talked about that. Encourage staff and management continuity. You've had turnover. Do what you can to encourage continuity. Keep the folks around on the team. All right? Got to be consistent with the staff. You now have contract project managers. You have to be certain that they're going to be consistent with the staff. Okay? which means they have to have guidelines, which have got to come from the program manager, okay? Uh, Re-establish effective communications throughout the project team. Figure out what, what is the most appropriate way. Whether it's stand-ups, I think you do stand-ups, right? Stand-ups are a good thing, all right? Do stand-ups, right? but do them consistently, all right? On a schedule, not just, that sounds like a good idea today, consistently. And you can do them at various levels. You also, can, you also probably can do all hands. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's important to do that. All hands gives you a chance to literally talk to people, and now they can't say, I didn't get that email. Um, you know, reestablish effective communication with the municipality. I mean, you, you're, you've got to start telling people what you're going to be doing, and you've got to be willing to make some promises. If you have a chunk, I call it a chunk, I'm sorry. If you have a chunk of work that you can get done by the end of May, put your promise out there and go for it. And people will, will know. They will know. 
uh, need more training. We talked about that. Uh, continue your organization change management strategy activities. As I understand that some of that activity has sort of fallen a little bit down now. They need to re-energize and get right back into using that. Plan some super user training. So you don't have to actually train the super users right now. You can just simply say, here's when we're going to train you. That'll help. That'll help them a lot. Oh, you're going to train me on that? Yeah, absolutely we will. And here's when. Recommendation. Solidify and clarify your project governance. So the first thing we looked at is the executive steering committee. So we think the steering committee's charter should be finalized. It has not been so far. All right, and then you need to be able to answer these questions. Okay, will the committee address only the synergy project? Should the committee consider other major initiatives and does the committee, uh, uh, committee oversee major initiatives? Right now there's a lot of focus on synergy, but if everybody agrees that the committee looks at other projects, then that's exactly the way it should operate and it should not necessarily meet real frequently and focus on synergy. That's what the other committee is for. Focus should be placed on oversight. MOA alignment and budgetary approval. That's what the executive steering committee should be doing. They shouldn't be worrying about staffing, project schedules. It's not, they don't need to do that. Meetings should be monthly. Any major projects executive sponsor would be a member of the executive steering committee and would then report to that committee for their project, okay? So our recommendation is that the ESC should become a municipality-wide steering committee that oversees the Synergy Project as one of many municipal projects. Functional steering committee. They have a charter that's not finished either. Okay? We think their charter should, focus, should make sure they focus on business decision conflict resolution. Have, when you have those conflicts and the pro program manager brings them to the committee, they resolve it. That's their job, okay? Focus on resource need resolution. So when their resource needs come at flying at them from the program manager, they gotta resolve it, okay? They gotta go find whatever resources need to be found. Ch focus on change management, budget schedule, and resource impacts. That's what they should be paying attention to and we, need, we suggest you rename the Functional Steering Committee to the Synergy Project Steering Committee. We think the committee needs to have a broader view than just function. It needs to have a broader view than just function. Okay? The executive sponsor should be the committee chairperson. Okay? The executive sponsor should be the chairperson because the executive sponsor is the connection to the executive steering committee. <coughs> Additional members, if we're going beyond just function, we're saying, oh, the program manager needs to be a member of the function, excuse me, of the Synergy Project Executive, Synergy Project Steering Committee. The program manager needs to be a member of that and needs to sit in the whole meeting, not just report for 10 minutes and leave. Now, they could be non-voting, but they need to be there the whole time. The systems integrator program manager should also be in that meeting and be a reporting person to that meeting, but non-voting. Okay? Now, potentially, if, if my understanding is that there's some discussion about SAP providing uh, some advisory support, that person should also probably be a member of that committee. And then if you go down the path of getting an internal, uh, an independent verification and validation contractor, that would also be a, somebody who would probably be a member of that committee. Yes, I'm self-serving. Uh, your, your independent observers should sit in on those meetings. Every one of them. I have a point of clarification sure. on this. So you've seen some of the SAP conversations, but you've probably already seen the executive branch proposed structure or current structure, including the RDI contract up for us next week. These elements that you're referencing here, I believe some of them already exist in that master plan. Is that, is that a fair summary? Do you see some elements of what you mean? No, I'm sorry. Well, the, the uh, systems integrator program manager, 
who is that? I mean, I, I guess. Mr. Chairman, that's Peloton right yeah, now. Yeah, that's Peloton. I mean, that's their, their senior leader. Their right. senior, and they're senior leader. Farther up, the thing you, you, you know, we should, sure. should put these people in there. Well, RDI is already in there uh, in terms of that name as well. So, you know, this delivers to me like it's broken, but I, I don't, I'm kind of quandaried on that. Have you judged what the executive branch has got either in essence already or proposing? Have you judged that what, based on this what, slide? What I, what I have suggested, and you'll see it in the organization chart, uh, is, is that you do have advisors to the executive steering committee. One of them is RDI, okay? But that person also is an advisor to the program manager and the executive sponsor. Okay. But you also should have um, the Peloton senior executive be part of the executive steering committee as well when synergy is on the agenda. I'm not here to challenge you. you you're the expert per se, but you're asking to take what you propose as a functional uh, steering committee and you're moving people up the ladder and down the ladder, that's going to be totally no, confusing. No, not really. I mean, most of the folks already exist up there at the executive steering committee. All I'm, all I'm trying to do with the functional steering committee is to, is to broaden its coverage, broaden its scope from just function okay. to include technology and to include contractors. Okay. Okay. Right. I, I got clarity there. Thank you. All right. Uh, meeting should be weekly, um, one hour meetings. The Functional Steering Committee should become the Synergy Project Steering Committee, so that's the rename. If you go to the next two pages, what I've done in, the, in these two pages is I've tried to provide you with a summary of the responsibilities of each of these various levels of governance and project management throughout this project. Okay? My purpose is to you know, try to show what the Executive Steering Committee should be doing. Those are the generals. Uh, what the Synergy Project Steering Committee should be doing, those are the kernels, okay? And then if you go to the next page, page 41, you will see this is the project management group, okay? You will see the program manager, which is the captain. You will see the project manager, which is the lieutenant. And then, as I mentioned to you earlier, the team leader, which is the sergeant and probably the key player in the organization. <coughs> And it's important that you take a look, when you have time, take a look at the responsibilities of that team leader, because that's where the tasking takes place. That's where you're working with you know, Joe and Susie and Bill and, and, um, and making sure that the work gets done, just like a sergeant in the military. Okay? You currently have a project management office, which is a grouping of the project managers and they report to the program manager. That's great. That's fine. That's the way it ought to be. Okay? The reason why we say reconstitute it, right, is that we, we think you need to add some players to the program management office. All right? We think you need to make sure that the systems architect is part of the program management office. We think that the, there should be a contract administrator part of the program management office. Systems architect focuses on system architecture issues that come up from the project managers. Oh, we need this and that in terms of the various ways that the hardware and then the network and so forth is put together. Okay, great. Um, contract administrator needs to be paying attention to all the change orders. That's where they bubble up. That's where they show up. So they, need, they should be there. Be aware of the change orders so you can track them and stay on top of them. The other two people that need to be part of the project management office is the project scheduler and the project administrator, which are the administrative roles that should be there to support the project. Okay? The members, and I show this on page 43, so the chairperson, the chairperson of the PMO is the program manager chairperson okay all the pro all the people that come become come to the excuse me all the people that come to the PMO meeting report to the chairperson I suggest no longer than 10 minutes no longer than 10 minutes each okay 
So what you see listed down there are the various project managers that probably should be reporting and the additional people that I also mentioned to you. And I think your independent QA person should observe the PMO meetings. Okay, improve the contractor usage. You need to assure accountability with your systems integrator. So you need to have deliverables, we said this earlier, if at all possible, to try to get pricing by deliverable. Uh, certainly you should manage your time and materials contract very carefully. Um, and you need to make sure that your systems integrator is represented at the appropriate levels within your management structure, which we've already talked about. Uh, the SI client executive should attend executive steering committees, uh, committee meetings. Um, you should consider a not to exceed contracting approach with your systems integrator. Uh, use an attorney that is familiar with contracting systems integrators. You might be able to get an attorney from ConocoPhillips. Okay. Uh, try to have um, an SI consultant matched up with each MOA team leader. Now we went earlier on. We talked about the folks complaining about that. Here's where you basically say, okay, now systems integrator, we need to have resources at all these places. Okay. Uh, with regard to your project managers who are contractors, certainly continue using them. That's a good, that's a good move. Uh, modify your agreements to make sure that they have uh, deliverables, okay? And make sure that they provide timesheets to you weekly. And there, that's happening, and I just want to make sure you continue doing that. Provide the promised project staffing. Each team should have a full-time process owner as the team leader. Full-time. Team leader, I'm not talking about the rest of the group that works on the project. The team leader, the sergeant, okay? Must be an MOA functional subject matter expert and probably you're gonna to need to backfill those, those individuals, okay? So count the number of modules, that's the number of team leaders and there, there's, there's the approximate head count. 18. <clears throat> Okay, approximate, yeah. Because you know some, some of those modules can be grouped, but, but still, yeah, that's exactly the kind of number we're talking. Um, for the teams that are utility specific, like projects or FERC, a full-time team leader should be from the utilities. That's how you handle that one. Make sure that utilities are driving that as a team leader, okay? Each team should have a corresponding systems integrator, subject matter expert, we've talked about that. Um, in the case of multiple SAP modules per team, there should be a full-time MOA subject matter expert with a corresponding SI subject matter expert for, for those modules. So, so, like I said, some of the modules get grouped together, one or two, so two or three sometimes, okay? And then the testing and data conversion team should have a full-time MOA project manager with full-time team members representing each major department for testing and data validation. When it's time, when it's time for you to do testing and data validation, you gotta staff up. You gotta staff up. Cannot short shrift testing and data validation. Just can't do it. You are cruising for a failure if you don't do it. And, and, and if it's not a failure, your testing will go on and on and on. And of course, if you don't staff up for your data validation, you're going to have famous garbage in, garbage out happen to you. It's going to happen. Murphy's Law is there. So you need to staff up. Now, those are, those are activities that can have very distinct blocks of time. They are not, I need this person for six months. I need these three people for one week is the kind of thing that you're talking about. And if you've got a good plan, there are no surprises, okay? Staff planning, okay, it's recognized that many of the MOA staff cannot be allocated to the project full time. We've, we've heard that. By chunking the work, you have to have an accompanying staffing plan that identifies the individuals, the task assignments, target dates, weekly hour expectation, as opposed to what you've been doing historically. What you've been doing historically is you say, Susie, Bill, and Bob are 25%. John is 50%. That's what you've been doing historically. No, 
you need to say I need Susie, Bill, and Bob for 24 hours, week two. And and if they're if they're on payroll, the following week it says payroll. It's really pretty straightforward. The plans in the case of larger blocks of time required of the part-time staff must be included in the schedule showing that the staff are unavailable at certain times. The CAFR story. Put in the plan. Put it in the plan. Staff accountability. How am I doing time wise? 15 minutes. Okay, I think we'll make it. I'd like to leave some room for conversation. Okay. You betcha. Uh, so we need to clarify duties and responsibilities. <coughs> These we've already talked about. All I'm trying to highlight for you here are a couple of key areas. Each one of those project managers that you've got working on this detailed plan should have their own project charter. Okay? That, by the way, is a deliverable. <laughs> Team leaders need to have a detailed task plan. So the project manager takes it down to them and say, okay, go figure out, here's, your, here's the people we got working on this thing. Who's going to do what? Okay? Establish accountability. I think we've talked about this. I think this is crucial, and it's very successful in terms of establishing accountability. Visible completion horizons, that's the next Friday story. That's the next Friday story. But you gotta make sure you have staff concurrence. They've gotta be willing to say, I can do it. I can do it by next Friday, okay? Now, if they say, I can't do it, then you say, oh, well, how about if we break this apart and you just do the first half? Can you do that by next Friday? Okay? It works. Lastly, if you're establishing accountability, you have to have consequences. Right? Now, don't think we, I mean, we would love to be able to say, oh, okay, you're a member of the team, the project manager can fire you. Don't think that's going to happen. However, you could provide for performance input from the project manager or the team leader on a staff person to their administrative boss. Okay? The other thing that you could do, this works, is to publish results. So if you have a, a long list, and let's say, let's say you've got a list of uh, how many reports do we have? 48? 48 reports or something like that? 48 reports. So I list 48 reports. I list them. And each one of them can probably be done, maybe not, if, again, but let's say for discussion purposes, each one of them can be done in a week. So I've got, I've got the list. I've got the target date for when to finish that report. It's in a list, and the team leader's doing this, not the project manager. The team leader's doing this. And then I've got Susie, Billy, Bob. I've got the list of names in here, and then I've got actual completions, and I got it up on the wall. And remember, I'm suggesting you have a larger room, and you don't have walls, and people see it. Consequences. <laughs> Discipline and rigor in project planning and scheduling. Okay? Each project component should have a designated project manager. Each project manager should do their own plan down to weeks and deliverables. Each project manager should, have, uh, should obtain their team leader's input into the development of that plan. Each project manager should, have, should work with their uh, team leaders to make sure they've got the staffing. Okay, and we make sure that the tasking is to individuals. I said that earlier. This is where you do it. This is where you say, John, that's your problem. That's your responsibility, not John and Bill. As soon as you say John and Bill, who's on the hook? You don't know. Or as soon as you say, oh, that's Peloton's problem. No. You got to say the contractor's name. Okay. Project scheduling. We've said this before, include other people's time, I mean, external requirements. Um, schedule weekly. Here's, here's one that I would suggest that you do, the project managers do, and that is when you look at your scheduling and you look at the hours, recognize that you're not going to get 40 hours a week. So when you try to calculate a full-time equivalent, divide by 32. Don't divide by 40. Streamline the project organization. 
Currently, you've got multiple layers of project managers. We suggest that you streamline that and you basically just have one layer of project managers reporting to the program manager. Move the organization change management uh, to a reporting relationship with the program manager. Provide SI resources to each team leader. Add contract administrator and uh, systems architect to the team. Okay. We've, we've said these things. Add the RGI project advisor to the team. I mean, that's sort of a person that's not on the project organization chart, but we got to have them there. I think he means RDI. RDI. Uh, R, did I say RDI? I'm sorry. RDI? Okay. I apologize. Thank you. If you go to page 58, it's almost impossible to see this, and I apologize, but I think the message is simply this. This is the recommended structure. We've tried to show the various advisors <laughs> to the various committees and so forth, but the thing I think is the message here is to see the red triangles. That's the message. You need to have your systems integrated with their SAP knowledge spread throughout the project appropriately, okay, and consistently. And where I have more than one triangle, it indicates more than one person. So, okay, but generally it's one. The budget outlook on page 60. I think I mentioned to you earlier that I looked at the, uh, the, the SAP report and they had different levels of hours estimated. Uh, and so I, I, I said, well, we ought to be able to at least, at least get an order of magnitude number by looking at those hours and generate a spreadsheet listing every line item that they had, okay, making the assumption that every line item would be done, all right? And literally then go through and say, okay, for, for the uh, low, medium, and high risk, put the hours in there. There is a range, there's no question there's a range, because there's uncertainty, that's, that's clear. The other thing I think I need to say is that, is that for the 500 plus ones, I took a very conservative view and said, uh, let's assume 1,500 hours for where it says 500 plus. Okay, that's a very conservative view, I'm just saying three times. Gives you order of magnitude numbers, okay? Also, because it's because you have different rates, and, you know. So when you when you go forward and you're starting to plan this thing, you got to figure out what portion of all those hours that the SAP tells you, what portion are contractor hours and what portion are MOA hours. So for the work, I would suggest to you, because it hasn't been done, but I would suggest to you that for for the work, it should be two MOA staff, one contractor staff for the work. When you get to the project management, because you have contractors who are in there as project managers, it's 80% of those hours are contractor and 20% is MOA. Those are suggested guidelines. Okay. So, so in essence, what you end up with, if you go to page 63, you end up with these hours. Now, those are hours and they are broad estimate, <coughs> low and high. And the items that are in red are items that have not been estimated yet. Okay, the items that are in red have not been estimated yet. So bottom line is you're looking at either 32,000 hours or 110,000 hours. And the red lines have not been estimated and there's no out-of-pocket cost for computers and all that other stuff software maintenance charges, none of that. <coughs> okay, let's go to the next, there we go. I got here. Yes, you did. <laughs> Not quite sure how to, to integrate your conversation in with this branch of government, but I appreciate the data and the observations that you've done. It's, it's incredibly thorough to be able to get your arms around it. The uh, clarity for us, that we don't run the departments, for me in particular, is that um, where an independent contractor makes sense and where a public employee makes sense uh, from all of that. And then lastly, it, it appears that you're saying, all right, the gun goes off, everybody kind of moves down the line. But I think there's, in my observation, interdependency on Data, uh, data cleansing is required on, on the output from that department. So uh, 
I, I think that it, it tends to be oversimplified when you say put all these people to work and it'll all come out the other end. But um, I appreciate at least the observations that you've had. The integration with SAP and their findings was something that I hadn't expected to be the case. I thought there would be more of a, uh, well, I find this and they find that. So there was a data sharing uh, both ways. I'm not going to ask SAP what they thought of yours because I cut Ms. Dembowski off when Peloton was supposed to weigh in from a contract. So thank you. I'm going to open it up now. Um, there's two so far. Uh, Mr. Evans, Ms. Gray Jackson, and now Mr. Peterson. Yeah, I appreciate it. I thought that it was a really good analysis, good uh, details about how to get things done, which is essentially what it comes down to. I think very useful for the administration to hear it. Not so much necessary for us, because if we start thinking about things in that granularity, it probably it's nice to know what you're telling them. Uh, so I think it was really good. All comes down to two things, I think. This is basically, this SAP project is like going to the moon or rebuilding Anchorage after the 64 earthquake. It's a big project, it's complex, it's hard. Uh, it's gonna take two things, and one is leadership, which I said before, and I just wanna reiterate, it's really about leadership at this point. Not that the mayor's been doing a bad job, I mean, it's the leadership of this specific project uh, and convincing this assembly that that leadership is there to do all the things you just mentioned. Because uh, there's other ways to do it too, but that's a good good advice for them in making their plan. The other thing is this assembly, I think our job um, when it comes down to it is every member of this body has to be satisfied that that leadership's in place so they can do the one thing they have to do and that is to go all in on this project the rest of the way. Uh, we can't shortchange resources. Either we're gonna do it or we're not gonna do it. Um, and we have to sort of set the tone not get into the details, but set the tone that this is a priority for the city. It's got to be done. We're putting the resources into it, and then take and then the administration takes it from there. Thank you. I got five in the queue with five minutes, so we can extend. Uh, well, we have something that apparently Stein was of the essence at three thirty, so I uh, was told we can't. Okay. Uh, okay. Miss Gray Jackson, go ahead. I'll be really, really quick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I'm assuming that we're going to hear the administration's comments at the February 27th work session. This. Okay, thank you. And also, um, the one thing to keep in mind, folks, is, uh, you know, right now we have a current administration serving as a leader for this project, but the current administration is going to be gone and the project is still going to be ongoing. And then um, our, our contractor talked about how um, we need to have a consultant, an independent consultant as an observer. And for those of you who don't know, part of our um, RFP included the successful bidder, who is Zig, to act as our observer on behalf of that. So that's a, that's already a piece that's already included in our contract with this company. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Peterson and Ms. Johnston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> and uh, one thing that kept coming back to in your presentation over and over was we need additional training. And uh, I've, I've trained employees many, many times over the years. And one thing that's important that the person doing the training has to be totally confident and well-versed in their subject matter. Mm -hmm. You can't have somebody that doesn't understand everything 100% themselves trying to train somebody else because then, you, you know, you get de a deterioration of the quality of your project. And so, uh, you know, I'm not sure who needs to schedule these trainings or who's going to need to do these trainings, but I, I think we obviously uh, need to emphasize training our people so that they feel confident in their abilities and so that they can pass on that confidence to the next person that they're going to have to train. At some point, somewhere down the line, mm -hmm. they're not always going to be there. They're going to have to train a replacement. So, good observations. Uh, Ms. Johnston? I just have a question about this. This one here was this. Is this an MOA chart or is this yours? That's a Zico Consulting <coughs> recommended organization chart. Mm -hmm. And and since you've heard it multiple times, what is the purpose of the RDI? They are advisors, external advisors to the the individuals shown there. The executive committee. And and the executive committee. That's correct. Or, project management advisors. So, and that's contracted. I mean, that's that's in place. Yeah, I just, I just, thank you. 
Okay. Great presentation. Thank you. To follow up that, I, there's a minute, I didn't mean to, are they supposed to be SAP experts? No. Experts on the workings of the city or experts on are we staying on track with the project implementation? The, the, the individual, as I understand it, the individual that's contracted is a project management expert. To notice that, hey, you just slipped a deadline, you just did this, or providing that kind of advice. And, and in fact, you know, it does an awful lot of trend analysis on the project. Mr. Steele. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, it's like starting over to a certain extent. We've got to, got to design the project to be successful. We've got to have in our mind that it's going to be successful or not go forward with it. And I don't think we have any option there. But um, one thing I learned. Uh, in, in school was you don't consider sunk cost when you're thinking about whether or not to go forward with a project. Uh, this is a valuable project and it is going to cost us some money. Uh, doesn't matter what we spent before, we're starting over in essence. We're starting at a point and we're going to have to commit the resources necessary to get it done. Well spoken. We've made some ground today. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I didn't ask you to comment on this. This was a presentation primarily to the Assembly, so um, not to be rude in that capacity. We'll have uh, more to say about this on the 27th uh, from both aspects and uh, other things that will be done. So, um, we're done.